for joining the NF Network webinar series. I'm Kim Bischoff, Executive Director of the Neurofibromatosis Rheumatosis Network, and we would like to welcome you tonight. These you. webinars have proven to be an excellent way for the NF Network to reach individuals all across the country. Tonight, we have 60 people registered for our webinar. We're very fortunate to have Rachel Sakoff, who is a pediatric speech language pathologist practicing from her new home in Jacksonville, Florida. Rachel is also a parent of a child with NF1 and a professional in child development. She will provide you insights and resources for helping your child while at home and beyond. Tonight we're going to be talking about 24-7 with my NF child, developmental strategies to cope during the COVID-19 social distancing. Tonight we'll discuss strategies to adjust to new stay-at-home orders, guidelines and restrictions, discuss the shift in roles due to the stay-at-home orders, review developmental challenges with children with neurofibromatosis, and share helpful resources for working through these challenges. Rachel will also reinforce the idea of radical self-acceptance as a parent to a child with an S, gain new insights, answers, and peace of mind as we learn new coping strategies for our children. So without further delay, I would like to, to introduce to you my friend, Rachel. Rachel, thank you for joining us tonight. Thank you, Kim. It's so such a pleasure to be here, and I appreciate that wonderful introduction. Um, just to give you a little bit of background, um, so as Kim said, I'm a speech-language pathologist, and my involvement with NF, with NF started about four years ago when my eight-year-old was diagnosed with NF. So I don't know if you caught that, but he was not diagnosed at birth, which um, is often the case. Um, when Amit was born, um, he had many developmental challenges in many areas, things that um, were present as early as infancy. We had difficulties with feeding and sleeping, um, getting into patterns, um, and then many other needs, motor, sensory, speech and language, and um, those were very um, apparent to me because of being in the field. And um, <clears throat> around age three, he started to develop cafe au lait spots on his skin, and thankfully we had a savvy pediatrician who caught that and said that this could indicate a underlying condition, and we did some genetic testing to verify that he does indeed have neurofibromatosis, and since NF1. And since then, I've become quite involved with um, the NF network. Um, and it's been such a joy because I know we've all been through uh, the challenges of absorbing that diagnosis in our families. And it was no different for me. Um, uh, there was a big uh, hurdle to um, accustom myself to this new reality. And it, it was a way, my involvement has been a way for me to turn things around and find the positive in all of this. So that's a little bit about me. Um, we're going to be using the chat tonight to connect with each other. And um, I hope everyone can find the chat on their screen. And what I'd like everyone to do is um, there will be times where I will pause and um, go through some of the messages that people are sending. But I really want it to be used also as a way for um, people across the country to connect and um, and learn from each other and see where they're what um, because we're so isolated at home right now to um, hear the points of view or um, the um, the perspectives of each other. So what I'd like you to do is um, go into the chat and share where you are from, your NF your child who has NF age, and something you're hoping to learn from today's webinar. And um, without further ado, I'm going to enter our presentation and go to our next slide. So here is today's schedule, and it's always important to start with a schedule. And I'm going to talk to you about that a little bit later on. That's, excuse me, one of our strategies is um, starting the day with a schedule. So here's today's agenda. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about this, the new stay-at-home orders. At this point, not so new. A lot of us have been dealing with this since um, early or mid-March. Um, some of our states are starting to open up. Some of our states are still very much closed and quarantined. 
So um, um, I'm sure this will um, be pre prescient for many of us. Um, we're going to do a review of neurofibromatosis and the developmental challenges that occur with neurofibromatosis. And um, I'm going to discuss some resources that I found really helpful in my home, as well as things that I've gathered from being um, a speech language pathologist. And then we'll have some time for a question and answer at the end. Okay. So, um, why are we here today? Um, well, everyone on this call has a child or maybe themselves have an NF diagnosis. And we all know that that presents unique challenges for every family. Um, I see the post on NF Moms Rock and NF Micro Deletion Syndrome um, on Facebook, and I see how hard it is, it is for everyone on a typical day of life. We have, as parents, we have concerns about things such as sleeping, nutrition, motor skills, speech, as well as just um, getting all the appointments fitted in to our day and our week. And now we have, um, with COVID-19, these extra challenges with the stay-at-home orders and the social distancing, which presents to us a really extreme challenge. Um, we all come from different backgrounds and different situations. Some of us have very, very young children. Some of us have teenagers or college-age students who are now living back at home with us. Some of us have had furloughs or been laid off from our jobs or our single parents. Um, we have unknowns of what the future will look like um, in the next couple months, let alone the future that we usually worry about for our children. Um, when will our children get back to physical school? That's the big question that we have in this country that has not yet been answered. And how do we juggle everything when we have children at home who also have these extra challenges um, due to neurofibromatosis? A lot of days I feel like I want to pull my hair out, and I, I'm pretty sure I'm not alone with that. And then what I'm hoping for in this presentation to, is to provide a dose of calm and management, which can hopefully be achieved through some planning, some utilizing some resources, and also um, letting go of our, um, of our expectations and of ourselves that can some, often as humans be the highest and beyond humanity. So I want to maybe relieve or alleviate some of that pressure for us. Um, Okay, so I want to talk a little bit about how our roles have shifted in the extreme. So on the left, you will see um, a, um, a, a little a, a round stairwell. And I put together some, some um, roles that we typically deal with um, before we had coronavirus as an aspect in our lives. We are parents and caregivers at the very bottom. We are breadwinners. We are the executives of our household managing the, the meals and the cleaning the toilets and everything else that goes with that. We are the managers of our children's health care, which is um, above and beyond what um, parents without a child with a medical condition manage. We have to fit in appointments, um, with specialists throughout the year, as well as sometimes procedures such as MRIs. We have to pay the bills, and we are the chief anticipators for our children. And what I mean by that is that um, having a child with a progressive medical condition like NF um, means that we're always anticipating what the next thing is that might occur on our children's skin or bodies or um, growth, different things that we're anticipating and always aware of on the back of our minds. And then we have this arrow which shows how have our roles not just shifted but expanded. Um, even though many of us still might receive therapies through a virtual format with all the technology that we have today, it's just not the same. So what we've become is we've become the OTs and the PTs, the occupational and physical therapists for our children, the speech language pathologists for our children. We've become many times the nurses and the nutritionists in our homes for our children. 
we've become the tech specialist. How many times during the day are you back and forth trying to put a Zoom um, a call on the computer or set up um, the devices so that your children are set with their education from day to day? We are dealing with psychological and emotional issues more um, acutely because of all of the trans transitions that we've had to deal with for ourselves and for our children. We are doing teaching, we are doing behavioral work, we are doing play therapy. We are doing so many things that even though we might have incorporated strategies from our, from our um, clinicians that are in our home or that work, that work with our children, Peripherally, now we seem to be have become the central um, um, in, uh, implementers of those of those um, uh, needs. I'm just going to look at the chat for a minute. So I'm just going to pause for one minute and see um, if we have any. Um, We have some people here from Florida. We have some people here from Pennsylvania. Um, and looks like I see John here and so, someone here from Brooklyn. So thank you for sharing. And I'm so glad you're all here. All right. So let's move on to the next slide. OK. So I want to talk a little bit about burnout, and burnout is real. Uh-oh. My slides are not loading properly. I'm sorry. One minute. No problem. I'm going to... Um, how do I go back? Click off. Click here. Here. Can you see it? Uh-oh. Oh, okay. So we're going to go back. I'm sorry about this. Some technical challenges with everyone being on the computer. Okay, here we are. Thank you for your patience. So burnout is a real concept. Um, I don't know about you, but the woman on the right is kind of how the last 12 weeks has felt like for me. Um, I came up with this concept with my friends about being a human ping pong ball because I feel like throughout the day, and I'm usually the one who's doing school with my kids at the dining room table in the morning, and I am going from a Zoom call to my son's math homework to my, my work. I'm still working with clients through teletherapy to another Zoom call for a child Oh no, it's almost 11 a.m. and they need a snack. Oh, did my child take his ADHD medication this morning? And my brain just never stops. I am constantly on. And that is just how things are. It's impossible to get a two or three hour window right now to get some um, deep um, work, some focus work done for myself. And I need to block it out at times with my husband, a lot of juggling schedules. I've had to be um, at times um, looser with my social distancing and get some help in my home. So that is what life is like right now. Um, Uh-oh, when is the speech therapy appointment on Zoom again? Uh-oh, let me look at my phone and check that. Um, oh, my mom's WhatsApping me, and on and on it goes. As a mom, that's what it's like. I'm a human ping pong ball all day long. And at the end of the day, there's just no energy. And I'm going to sleep, falling asleep in bed at 8 or 9 o'clock with my kids. How does that, how is that our new reality? Okay. So let's savor the successes and apply a dose of acceptance that things will be far from perfect. Every day, even from one hour to the next, we have our highs and we have our lows. It's all day long, um, and I, I, um, I encourage everyone to think of at least once a day or once a week, is there one success that you can um, savor, you can remember, and, and um, 
and think about as, um, okay, so if I've had that one success in my child's day or in my day, then okay, it's, it's been a good day. Maybe your child completed a worksheet that they were supposed to do. Maybe they had a good lunch that day and they were calm for an hour. Um, maybe they even were helping you put laundry in the machine. It was, even if it was a tough day, and there are plenty of days where we have tough days where it just feels like it's chaos all day long, that's okay too, because right now, perfection is not the goal. Um, I have a story that um, my mother-in-law asked me one day on the phone, how was your day today? And I responded, um, well, the kids are fed and my husband is still alive and I'm not in jail. So I think so far it's a pretty good day. And um, that was one of those days where really underneath all of that, it was pretty tough. Um, but it's good to laugh and it's good to have a dose of um, humor and equanimity in all of this. Okay. So now I'm going to talk a little bit about neurofibromatosis and some of the neurobehavioral challenges that come up. Um, we're going to review some of the um, primary developmental characteristics that children with an F present with. I'm not going to focus on the medical aspects of neurofibromatosis today, but um, when we talk about development, it's, it's the aspects of um, behavior that affect our children's every day-to-day, -day, our day-to-day -day lives from moment to moment. And I love this picture of this child with his, um, with his very full brain. It shows all the things that a 21st century kid has to manage cognitively every day. We have technology here. We have, um, we have a microphone. We have books. We have science. We have reading. We have writing. We have play. So, um, connecting with our friends, so that's, that's um, indicative of what we're, we're talking about here. Okay, so what are the characteristics of NF1? And I'm going to go through them one by one. So many of our children present with sensory motor challenges. One of the hallmarks of the condition is low muscle tone. That was a big one for us. Um, Amit was a flossy baby um, as he grew. There was poor coordination, kind of walked around like Pinocchio without strings, or had strings, but they didn't hold him down. Kind of, kind of um, ataxic, kind of loose. Um, and um, I, I think that poor coordination is something that a lot of parents um, notice with their children. Things, they see it maybe during meal time, getting that, getting that, um, the fork or the spoon to get to the mouth. Um, so that's, that's something that comes up. Um, a lot of children um, have difficulty with the mechanics of writing due to some of those fine motor challenges. And as they enter elementary school, we see that more and more. Um, some of the sensory motor challenges um, cause difficulty with awareness of your proximity between yourself and other people. So if you, um, if your sensory system is um, not um, functioning at its best and your um, touch receptors, your touch sensors, and your awareness of your body and your limbs in space is not sound, you don't necessarily always notice how, how strong or how um, graded your movements should be between you and other people. And that can cause... Um, a secondary challenge with, with, with social challenges between um, peers um, and challenges as parents because it's like, why is my child flopping on me? Why is my child um, not able to recognize when, where his body is? Um, and so that can be hard for, for us. Um, we have children who have regulatory challenges um, we, um, as humans, develop patterns. We are supposed to develop patterns with sleeping and um, wake and sleep cycles and when, when do we get hungry, when are we um, satiated. Um, all of those things are related to our sensory system and that is hard or degraded for a lot of our children. Some of us have feeding 
challenges and nutrition challenges. So I would put all of that under the sensory motor. Um, this is my area of professional expertise. Um, a lot of our children have speech and language delay um, or disorder, and that can fall under our ability to articulate the sounds of our speech correctly and knowing where our tongue should hit the, the palate or the different muscles of the mouth working correctly together. That's called myofunction. The muscles is myo. And language delays um, is also something that is present in children with NF. Um, between 30 to 70% of our children have attention deficit disorder. <clears throat> is Kim trying to say something to me right now? Nope. We're, we're all good, nope. Rachel. Everything is fine. Okay. Sorry. I was hearing some, um, some feedback on the line. We're all good. Okay. So with attention deficit disorder, um, one thing that goes along with that is our children have executive functioning challenges, which really means that our, our ability to plan and, um, and gauge what is happening in our, what is about to happen and to respond effectively and appropriately to be able to break things down into steps. Um, and it doesn't just apply during school. It applies, we see these challenges with play um, when children are younger and they can manifest themselves differently. They look different at different ages, but executive functioning challenges are a very, um, another hallmark of um, neurofibromatosis. Um, children with ADHD can have externalizing behaviors, which means sometimes they're not aware of um, the way their um, their bodies are um, are impacting other people, and again, that's that uh, affects some of the social sides of of development. Many of our children have learning disabilities or cognitive impairment. Um, we have ling under that we have language comprehension delays, language expression, reading and writing, math, and then lastly, 30% of children with NF1 have autism spectrum disorder, um, and with that comes social cognition challenges, and I'm going to spend some more time on that later. Um, <clears throat> so I'm going to have um, ask you to use your chat again, and um, if you could share the single biggest challenge that your child presents with, the thing that affects the day-to-day -day functioning the most for you. When I think back on um, the eight and a half years of parenting a meet, I think the thing that stands out for me the most is the when he was a toddler and preschooler that he was so sensory seeking and he never stopped moving and was always into everything. He didn't have any stranger danger. He didn't know that he had to stay next to mom and dad and he was just all over the place and I needed eyes on every side of my body and it was very stressful. Okay, hold tight. We're going to get to some strategies soon. I'm going to talk a little bit about NF2 and schwannomatosis. This is not my area of expertise, but I didn't want to neglect um, talking about this because um, we even have, there are cases where even though um, some of the characteristics of NF2 and schwannomatosis sometimes don't show up until later in two, um, development or adulthood, um, there are children who are um, more and more often be um, are the are becoming diagnosed earlier on. Um, so ch parents are aware of their children's diagnosis of NF2 earlier on than before in many cases. Um, hearing loss is a big thing that can occur with NF2 and vision challenges or vestibular. Vestibular means balance challenges. Um, hearing loss, that's a, that our, our hearing is a sensory system. And if, when, you know, if hearing is not perfect, um, you have difficulty with understanding. 
difficulty with speech development and um, can cause, again, some challenges with peer relationships or with um, being with learning with school. So those are things that can come up um, with schwannomatosis, which I will say know the least about. But we did, there are neurological effects on parts of the body, the, the arms and the legs. Um, and then there are neurological issues like headaches, pain management issues too. So the, I want to reinforce this concept that we've all heard of autism spectrum disorder, but the truth is that there's a spectrum of severity for every domain and for every child. There is no one size fits all. So some, for some of our children, sensory challenges are severe or they're mild. Or, um, you know, some of our children have lower IQs. Some of them have higher IQs. There's all these differences between all of us. And um, I know there's many of us on this webinar, and we all have children of varied ages and varied challenges. So my hope is that each of you can find one takeaway from this presentation that will apply to your child. When I go to um, a two or three day conference, if I find one strategy or one uh, research study that I've, that I've attended that is um, applicable to me in my practice, then I feel like it was a worthwhile conference. So I, I know not everything that I'm talking about relates to everyone on this call. But I did want to mention that there's a spectrum of severity, and not everything will apply to everyone today. Um, on the next slide, I wanted to remind everyone to not miss the forest for the trees. We just had, uh, we spent some time talking about all the challenges that our child present with, our children present with, but our children also have unique strengths and resiliencies too. And um, I think I, I, I urge you to remember or to think about one, um, the, the shining light, the thing about your child's personality that you would never trade in for the world. It, it's a gift that comes with, it, maybe it's part of their personality anyway, or maybe it's because of their neurofibromatosis. Um, and to remember those things because they are valid and they are important and they make every everything that we do worthwhile. I'm going to pause and look at the chat because I want to see what people have responded. It looks like um, for some of the parents, when I, when I asked before about your biggest challenge, some of the parents um, on the call have said emotional regulation. And for others, ADHD seems to be a big challenge. So it looks like we are all part of the same club. Okay. Now I'm going to get into the meat and potatoes of, um, of our time together. So talking about some strategies and resources. Excuse me. Taking time to load, so bear with me. I have some graphics on here. Okay. So as you can see on the right here, we have Joseph's Day. It's a schedule. And I encourage you, one of the things to think about with all of this non-structured at home time 24 7 with your child is starting the day with a schedule um, there's a couple of reasons why schedules are so important and i'm going to talk about those um, pictures help with language comprehension so for children that have speech and language delays um, if there's a picture attached to the word that they hear it's more impactful and their attention to the words that you're saying is better. 
Pictures are sustained. In other words, they stay there. They don't disappear. But auditory directions are transient. As soon as I say the sentence and I'm done with the sentence, the sentence is gone. Okay, now I'm back talking again and I'm on to the next thing. But if I have a picture, the picture stays in front of you and you can focus on it and it doesn't go away. So it helps um, for our children who have these um, speech and language challenges or attentional challenges to use pictures um, to help them move through the day. When the pictures are present, the child knows what's coming next. So I see a picture of, a, of getting out of bed and I know once I've done that, I get to go downstairs and have breakfast or whatever. This is backwards for me. I would probably get dressed before breakfast, but um, this is, um, that's another reason why um, schedules are so, so helpful, the ability to predict. And, and that goes back to children with executive functioning challenges who have that difficulty with planning and organizing. If they can predict what's coming, um, the, they'll function much better. And um, schedules will really help the whole family not just the child, but everyone to set a structure or a routine for the day. Um, schedules don't have to be high tech. This is something that came off of Word. But there have been days where I take a loose leaf piece of paper from a notebook and I just use the marker and I number, I don't use times or I'll just use numbers and I'll write what's first, second and third and fourth. If um, it's a day where things are just more chaotic and and out of out of sync with the day before it does help to have a routine that is set that can be followed from one day to the next for the week or for the month but i know that that's not so possible when your meetings for work your virtual meetings might change every day and your availability to be right there for your child might change every day so you do the best you can but if if you start the day with a schedule um I think you'll see some improvements. Um, I use this website called LessonPix.com, and I'm going to highlight some things about this website that I love. Excuse me. I'm going to take a drink. Okay. So Lesson Picks is a website which allows you to um, create materials. Um, the, um, what you can do is you can go to the search window on the top right and you can search for pictures or categories. When you find, you'll, you'll see a, a page come up with um, the pictures that you're looking for. They'll, you can um, add them to your tray. Once you have the pictures that you want, you can create materials. You're not creating them from scratch. On the next page, I'm going to show you. Um, over here, that when you create your materials, um, you can choose a number of different kinds of materials on the drop down that are already pre-designed and you can literally just take your pictures and plop them in to the format that you're looking for. If you're looking to make picture cards, if you're looking to make a schedule, if you're looking to make first then boards, which I'm going to talk about in a minute. Um, <clears throat> and then um, I'm going to go back to this page. There's a sharing center on this um, website where you can um, find materials that have already been made by other people that are shared. And there's a lot of great stuff on there. Um, you can also um, upload pictures that you've taken on your phone or your camera, um, which is fairly easy to do. <clears throat> you just upload them, send them to yourself. I usually send them to my email. I download them onto my computer, and then I upload them from wherever I downloaded them from onto Lesson Picks, and I can use the specific pictures that are really relevant for my child's life 
Um, it's pretty, uh, it's very user friendly. Um, and I, so a lot of the websites that I'm highlighting today have specials right now because of so, um, the quarantines that are existing across the country. So I encourage you to check them out and see if there is a, um, something that might work for you that could, could be beneficial. So these are just some more examples of different schedules. This is a schedule on the left um, with getting dressed. I would say that would be very helpful for a child who has um, fine motor challenges or sensory challenges and can get or can get distracted between each step of that process. So having a schedule for all the steps that it takes to get dressed sounds crazy, but if it needs to be broken down to that degree, then that's what it needs to be. And something like that would be very helpful um, for an older child that is doing their school from home. This middle schedule looks great. You have breakfast, you have computer time where you're doing your schoolwork. Maybe you don't have to break that down as much, so that can be its own thing, its own um, item. Playing outside needs to be on there because we all need a break. Lunch and then read to yourself. Here's another one on the right, a morning routine. So, um, I hope those are just food for thought for you. There's a lot of great schedules on Google Images that you can get ideas. Um, if you have a speech therapist that your child is working with, I encourage you to utilize that person or an occupational therapist to come up with um, to help them uh, work with you um, to figure out what would be a good first start if this is something that's new for you. Okay, so I've moved on. That's it for schedules. Um, I'm going to talk now about first then and when then boards. So what is a first then board? It's what, it's this thing on the right. I have a blank one and then one that's got two items in it. And they really help sequence non-preferred and preferred activities. Um, um, so if reading is first, then tablet time is what you get next. So first, first you need to do your reading, then you need to do, then you can have your tablet time because tablet time is probably way preferred than doing our reading work. Again, the pictures help with comprehension. Um, the when-then language is better for older children. It leaves less room for negotiation, and it's not as threatening. So I often do that with my eight-year-old. I'll say, when you put your dishes in the sink, then you can have dessert, for example. Um, you don't need to make – you can use an, a website like Lesson Picks to create this, or it can be really low-tech. You can use a – put it – Put the piece of paper in a sheet protector with a dry erase marker and check off each one as it's done. So you have an action for complete for completion. And again, there's a lot of examples online for these. Okay, so that's the that's the next strategy. We're moving on to sensory based activities. Okay. So here's what we know. We know that increased sensory input throughout the day helps our kids regulate their bodies and improve their attention and their communication skills. Many children lack the internal regulation to keep their bodies calm and on track. Um, if you have a sensory activity, it will keep your child engaged for a longer time block when you need to get on your, to your Zoom call. So I'm thinking, Referring back to our situation where we're at home, if there's an activity that you can set up for your child which keeps them engaged and attending for maybe 20 minutes or 30 minutes, that's 30 minutes of your day where you can actually get something done. And um, alternatively, if you do have time to stay with your child or want to, it can be a great opportunity for bonding and connecting um, and using language with your child about the activity um, and that might be your one 
uh, connection, connecting activity with your child and that's positive when the rest of the day can feel very chaotic. Sensory activities provide the right kind of input. They're tactile, they're multi-sensory versus another show or, or movie. And you can decrease the burden on yourself and embed the, some sensory activities into daily routine. For example, washing your hands, at, or at bath time, during play, during academics, and I'm gonna show you some examples. Um, um, I remember when my child was younger, um, when I did the dishes, I might put him on a chair next to me in the sink and he would do the dishes in air quotes with me where the water was running, he had his hands wet, he had soap, and he was able to um, stick with um, a routine that was part of the routine that I was doing anyway, and it wasn't something extra that I had to fit into my day. So that's just an example of how you can fit in sensory activities into your already hectic routines. So here's some examples of sensory activities. I'm gonna go from left to right. We have these goose line bags to practice letter writing. Um, and then up on top, you can do painting with nature, go out for a nature walk, collect some leaves, put some paint on the back of the leaf, make some, some leaf images, use, use the leaves as a paintbrush. Um, when your child is in the bath, let's get some shaving cream on the walls and let's just play with the shaving cream and do fun things there. Um, Bath time is very regulating, and then they get their sensory input at the same time. Um, again, that's part of a daily routine. You didn't need to do something extra or find time in your day for some fancy project. And on the bottom, there's a bin of um, beans. I like to use lentils because I find that they're um, not so messy. Rice is kind of, rice has a residue, for example. Um, different kinds of beans is fine, and then you can hide different objects in in the in the bin, and they can find them and you can talk about them, and then play with them. There are thousands and thousands of ideas for sensory activities online. I'm sure you've all been on Pinterest or Google Images or Teachers Pay Teachers and different kinds of for different kinds of ideas. Um, if you'd like to in the chat. You can share with your fellow parents one sensory strategy that you've used since stay at home that, is, that you felt was really helpful and that you'd like to share. That would be a nice um, opportunity to, to collaborate tonight. Okay, so here's some other resources that I like for sensory activities. The American Occupational Therapy Association, AOTA.org has lots of resources for parents and education about um, the different kinds of um, sensory and fine motor challenges and resources for how to address those. I'm gonna talk a little bit more about pathways.org. This is um, an amazing organization based outside of Chicago. Um, they have created a huge library of resources for parents of young children starting at birth with lots of videos to demonstrate developmental norms you would expect for each stage of development, whether it be motor or speech or language or sensory or play. Um, they have resources for different kinds of activities you can do with your child to harness growth in those areas. Um, and I want to just highlight that the thing with intervention is that Although it's important to know what the underlying condition or diagnosis is for each child, um, as interventionists, we look at the outcome or the behavior that is being presented. So development that is atypical can manifest itself in many of the same ways across different syndromes and different disorders. So even though my child presented with low muscle tone and sensory challenges, which are truly related to NF, um, another parent who has a child with Down syndrome might be dealing with that same manifestation because of their Down syndrome. 
So um, what I'm what I'm trying to say is that an an organization like this or a website like this, it doesn't have to be specific to neurofibromatosis, because what we're looking for is we're looking for ways to um, to um, improve functioning for the outcome behavior that our children is presented with, not necessarily treat the NF, if that makes sense. So um, I encourage you to go on this website because I think they have done such an excellent job with their videos and their resources um, for developmental challenges. Okay. Whew. How are we doing on time? We are, I got to speed through. Okay, so we're going to say, um, we're going to talk about screen time. And we're going to talk about how much screen time should we be um, utilizing now during the stay at home order, um, the different kinds of screen time, active versus passive. And I'm going to look at four different websites for active screen time. We're, um, Going to look at the current recommendations from the American Academy of Pedi Pedi um, Pediatrics on time usage during quarantine. Okay. Um, so screen time for kids in a no longer taboo world. Everyone's using screens, just how it is right now. But how much is too much? There's an article from Contemporary Pediatrics, and I put the link here. You'll get the slides um, when we're done. And the quote, the take home quote was that extra screen time may be inevitable, but the guidance says to turn that media to helpful avenues. So what are those helpful avenues? I'm assuming they're not referring to the Looney Tunes of my 80s youth. Let's take a deeper look at that. <clears throat> okay, so with screen time, we have passive screen time and we have active screen time. When I think of passive, I think of it as pure entertainment. Um, your child does not have to respond in any particular way, and understanding or um, critical thinking is not required by the show. Um, I My tip for you is to set a designated time block for passive screen time. That's okay. I usually I live in Florida, so the heat of the day is the best time for that, for my children sometime between like two and five, maybe an hour or two of watching a movie or what, whatever it is when they need a, um, when they need a break and I need a break. Um, act, whoops, sorry, I did not mean to do that. Active screen, active screen time on, um, alternatively, requires back and forth engagement. It's dynamic. It can, um, in, the, in other words, the skill might, um, the skill that's required might advance as your child goes through the activity. Um, it's, um, it requires actively engaging your mind. And I think we're going to see because of, even though there are a lot of great resources for active screen time, I think we're going to see enormous growth in this area within society in the next, in the following years after, once once we get through this. And even now we're seeing more and more um, great resources for active screen time. Just something to think about that I thought about, and my husband and I are still working on this, to be careful about video games, even though they are active in, in the way that there is a back and forth, there is an, an active, engagement, that the child needs to do something, um, they are can be highly addictive. And because there is no concrete end in sight, there's no, there's just always one more aspect or one more thing that the child needs to do in, in the video game. Um, some things that we've tried at home are setting a timer for usage, or if you're able to, um, on your actual TV or on your, um, on the unit that you're using, whether it's Xbox or Nintendo or whatever, um, if you can set a timer so that it turns off after a certain amount of time, if you're able to discuss and come to an agreement with your child how much time is appropriate. Um, we're still figuring that out. That is a work in progress in our family, and we do see that um, turning off or separating from that um, 
uh, the video game usage is one of the hardest things that we deal with in our house. I also want you to think about maybe having a power down time over the weekend. Give your eyes a break from that blue light. Connect with your family in other ways. There's board games, card games, take walks. If, you, if you're um, in a city and that's not possible for you, maybe finding a science experiment online or doing a baking activity together. So just some things to think about to try and get away from so much of that screen time that we're so dependent on right now. Um, okay, so here's some websites that I'm gonna refer to for active screen time. I have been using Epic getepic.com. It's a collection of online books where you can, your child can do decoding practice, reading comprehension. They have audiobooks where the book is read to the child by an author. As a parent, you can search for books by the reading level, by the topic, the age of your child. Um, there are parent and professional versions. Um, again, there are specials going right now. Um, you can create profiles for each kid in your family, um, and you can pre-select the books and add to the profile. So, or the child can go and do searches and then select their favorites, and then they'll be saved for later, which allows you to hand over some control to your child to make the choices. Um, and it's great for a variety of ages. So um, here's a screenshot, and I encourage you to check it out. Here's another one. It's called Vux. Com. It's a library of um, high-level literature for children. Um, they're read-aloud animated storybooks. They're great for younger children. I encourage you to check that one out. Um, I'm going to zoom through these because of our time. Um, Toytheater.com. Um, <clears throat> it's a collection of interactive educational games. Um, one of the things that I've been able to do since becoming this expert at Zooming um, is screen share a, um, a game between my, my child and their peer, and then they can play with each other tic-tac-toe or uh, checkers or connect four and have a play date, a socially distanced play date. Um, okay, and this website, or ne this next one is called socialthinking.com. Um, I'm going to spend a couple minutes on this. So what is social thinking or social cognition? Um, so it's a, a, a big concept within um, the field of early childhood development. Um, here's a little graphic that or social thinking requires social attention and being able to interpret what other people um, are thinking or saying, being able to problem solve and respond appropriately to that to that um, awareness. So I want you to think, go back in time and think about when you were dating. And I want you to ask yourself, did he know or does he know that she knows what he is thinking about her? And I'll ask that one more time. Does that boy know that that girl knows what he is thinking about her. So that's like a three or four level perspective taking. And something like that, obviously I'm giving you an adult example, but that's something that can be hard for our children, that ability to get inside the mind of another person, that theory of mind and awareness of what is another person thinking. Um, if we can do that back and forth perspective taking, we can attend to the thoughts and feelings of others and predict what their responses might be. And then we can prepare our own response. We can predict and we can plan. Um, it requires the ability to interpret a situation and how others will react to it, as well as problem solve the best way to respond yourself. So many children, as I talked about earlier, have a difficulty with social cognition. Um, some have a full-blown autism diagnosis and some that don't still struggle to some degree with some social thinking. The good news is that social cognition is another skill and it can be taught. There, you can um, have uh, therapy and good 
good modeling, and there's a lot of strategies and ways that that can be worked on and improved. So this, this, this website has some great materials for that purpose. Um, <clears throat> Michelle Garcia Winner is the uh, grandmother of social thinking and one of the leading experts in the field. Um, I said that already. So on the website, there are some great books, book series to teach concepts of social thinking. There's one called We Thinkers, another one called You Are a Social Detective, and Superflex. Here's a screenshot. Um, in the middle, you'll see free stuff for home and school. So I encourage you to check it out because there's some videos and some great resources there for um, to address social thinking challenges. And again, active screen time. Okay, so we're moving on. Podcasts. I think podcasts are great. Um, why? Podcasts are great for auditory stimulation and language development. I think especially for our children with ADHD who are often insatiable in their need for mental stimulation. Some children do better at independent play when there's something to listen to in the background. Um, if you have Google or another um, home device, you can cast a podcast into the room. You can have the child listen with headphones through um, a device so they're the only ones who hear it and you can get your work done. Here are some examples of some of my favorite podcasts and you'll get the slides for these. Um, two of them are through NPR, Wow in the World is, and Two What's in a Wow is our, one of our favorites. Story Pirates, um, they have collected, they, they, have, they encourage children to um, write in, write and send in their stories and then they turn the story, the child's story into a full-blown web um, podcast story. That's a great one. My daughter loves that. Um, Brains on. These are just a couple. And then I've um, listed a link here from a New York Times article about that just came out in March of 2020 because I think it sounds like New York Times and I agree. Podcasts have, are probably a great way to um, pass the time during social, at-home social distancing. Okay. We're nearing the end. So we're going to establish some boundaries. Boundaries are allowed and they are important. This may be impossible for our parents of younger children and I encourage you to hang in there. It will get better. Um, it might be impossible because um, they don't, your children might not understand that mommy needs to take this call right now or that mommy needs a break. And that's just, that's the stage they're in. Promise you this stage will not last forever. For elementary and older students, I think it's important to carve out concrete time blocks for kids to make their own fun. It's important, um, you can put it on the schedule or use a timer for that. Um, I think it's especially important for our children with NF due to their high sensory and attentional needs and their difficulty with social cognition and perspective taking to explicitly be taught that there needs to be time in the day where they need to entertain themselves and make their own fun. I'm not telling you to leave, leave them alone or um, completely ignore or be negligent. What I'm recommending is them learning that there are spaces in the day where they're in the playroom or they're in their bedroom and you're elsewhere and you're trying to get your work done. Mommy, mommy has mommy work to do. And during this time, these are your options. Um, <clears throat> a little vignette for my own life. My son is insatiable in his desire to read Harry Potter throughout the day. There are days where he's scheming all day long. How am I going to get more Harry Potter reading time with my parents? And he's coming up with ways. If I do this, will you read me Harry Potter tonight? If I help with the dishes, will you give me 20 more minutes of Harry Potter? And it's just exhausting because it's all day long. It's, it's a, sometimes it can become kind of an obsession. So there have been times where I've said things like, 
you can say one more thing about Harry Potter, and then I'm not talking about Harry Potter again until bedtime when we read. And that is a clear boundary. My child is learning that mommy's not available for that conversation anymore, and that's okay. Um, mental health, this is a big one. I really can't stress enough how important it is to have an awareness of mental health through all of this. There are real factors that are mentally burdensome during this time. We have adjustment issues. We can be, it can be lonely to be at home if you don't have a big support system, if you don't have family nearby. Um, it's overwhelming to have everything to do in a day, plus your kids at home, plus your work. There are financial stresses. There's unknowns about the future. We live in an age, thankfully, where technology is, allows us to, on some level, to connect with other people. But just my, um, my empathetic, um, my call to action that if any of you feel at any point that you're really spiraling downwards, there are, um, a, the a lot of our insurance companies have implemented virtual or phone-based mental health supports, and I encourage you to explore those because um, and just be mon um, um, uh, aware and um, and conscientious of your mental health. In this next slide, I took this classic song by the birds, Turn, 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 and I changed it to depict some of our needs during this time. <clears throat> there will be moments that we as parents will need a time to dissociate and then other times where we will have a time to feel everything very strongly. You are allowed to have a time to grieve and you can have a time to forgive yourself that you even need to grieve in the first place. Allow yourself hope, a time to hope. The situation will not be everlasting. If you find yourself traveling down the road of hopelessness, that truly is a red flag for um, the mental health concerns, and I encourage you, again, to um, reach out to your, um, your physician, your mental health provider, your insurance company, and let them know you'd like to talk to someone. Um, <clears throat> let's make sure we all practice this concept of radical self-acceptance. There will be moments of intensity in every day and every week. We all, we all manage our emotions in different ways. Children have tantrums or rages. Adults get sad or down or overwhelmed. Um, frazzled, stressed. Um, I think it's okay to set aside a time to share feelings or one thing that your child misses from before we were all at home. And um, here's a little vignette of how one, one instance, um, maybe five weeks in, we'll return the chaos into catharsis. Um, my, I went with my daughter who does not have enough typical, typically developing child, um, but definitely seeing some behavior since we were all, since we've all been at home, we decided we would make some cupcakes and then drive over to her teacher's house and drop them off and not leave our car, but be able to have a little socially distanced uh, connection with the teacher. And that was a great, a great two hours of her day. And later that night, guess what? She had an enormous tantrum and broke down and was on the floor kicking and screaming. And I waited patiently with, um, with uh, it was hard. I had to um, uh, find my inner self-control, waited patiently until she was done and reminded her that when she's done crying, I'm here to listen. And she eventually did. And then at dinner, I took the opportunity to say, like, to encourage the family, for, for each member of the family to share something that they miss about um, normal life so that we can all acknowledge that this is not an easy time. And we all felt better after that. And it was a nice moment for us. Um, Dr. Green um, is the superintendent of schools for Duval County where I work in Jacksonville, Florida. And she wrote in an article to parents, and I, I quote here, you cannot fail at this. There is no roadmap, 
No one has experienced this before. Whatever learning is happening, whatever you are managing to get done, and however your family is persevering, consider it a victory. And that is I'm a couple minutes over. I apologize if you had somewhere to be or you live in sleep because of me. Um, now is the time for some questions and answers. Um, if you have any questions, um, this is the time to ask them. And um, we've, we've uh, arrived at the end of our, our conversation today. And then um, I just put on the last slide a little bit of information about myself. Um, while you come, while you take the time to ask whatever questions you want to ask, if any if anyone has any questions, I have a couple more minutes. I'm available to respond, and please put them in the chat. Okay, so it looks like we don't have any questions. Um, I'm going to take two minutes to just tell you a little bit more um, about myself. Um, I'm a licensed pediatric speech therapist, and I've been practicing for 13 years. And I've worked in a variety of settings. Um, the last two years, I have um, gone with Kim Bischoff and the team from the NF Network to advocate for research funding on Capitol Hill, and that has been a completely empowering experience for me. I encourage you to get in touch. Um, I've listed my email and um, my website at the bottom of this slide. Um, I'm happy to answer any of your questions or point you in any direction that might be helpful for you. Um, and I really appreciate um, everyone who has come, come and signed on tonight to be part of this webinar about being 24-7 with your child with an F. Thank you so much. Rachel, this is Kim. I wanted to make sure um, I said thank you. What a, an amazing webinar you put together for us tonight. You gave us so many really great resources that we'll use. I've been taking copious notes here um, so that we can help families when they call as well to give them links to this webinar, which we found on the NF Network website in just a couple of days. Um, the, the lesson pitch site, the pathways.org. I definitely will be going back and looking at some of these resources and putting them together in a list so that we can share them with families. I, I am seeing different people um, saying thank you um, in their, in their um, question box. I don't think people were able to access the chat for some reason tonight, Rachel. Um, but I okay. Saying thank you. Thank you. I look forward to using the resources that you're providing. Um, thank you. My son also has a micro deletion. Um, and then, and then somebody else says, thank you so much. It was great. So we have people saying thank you. And I, too, would just like to say thank you. Thank you for giving up your time tonight and all the time that it takes to prepare this. Some of you may not know, but Rachel is actually not only taking care of two children, but she's expecting very, very soon. So this time is precious that she gave to us this evening. And and we really wanted to say thank you. We truly appreciate it. This is a great resource that we, we will all enjoy for a long time. Thank you very much. Thank you. Take care. Thank, thank you for the opportunity. Thank yeah. you. Have a good night. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.